Our speaker tonight is a Dr. Todd Barkman, and he is a professor of biology, biological sciences at Western. His work covers a wide array of topics, including parasitic plant genome evolution, tropical plant taxonomy, evolution of caffeine production in plants, and population genetics of rare species in Michigan and Southeast Asia. Over the past 20 years, 23 years at Western, he has taught uh, general biology, plant systematics, and molecular biology laboratory. I know of Todd for two passions of his. One is for plants, and uh, the other is for students. Uh, he's passionate about both. And I remember meeting with, with him and his plant systematics class and Steve Cato on a uh, hillside on Howard Street, just above the, uh, the Western campus, where the class students had discovered a, a stand of a rare species, a dwarf hackberry. And uh, I watched Todd working with his students and with Steve and the energy and the passion that he put into it, including uh, the care that he took with uh, the attempt to preserve a nest of voles that his students had uncovered in their, in their digging. Uh, Todd's passion includes all of our relations. And I remember also uh, hearing of his uh, stand in favor of the trees down in the valley. A lot of trees were going to come down in favor of a student dining hall. And the students were uh, demonstrating against that. And Todd said, he was quoted in the newspaper as saying, <clears throat> I will stand in front of the tree cutters before I will see that happen. Well, the university, and this is rare, did back down and delayed the uh, construction for a year while they rethought this. And uh, so it was a partial win. I don't know whether the university made its decision on the basis of the TV publicity that might have resulted from the chainsawing of uh, Todd Parkman, I don't know. But uh, I think his passion for plants and for students and for student causes and for the environment are wonderful. And I think we, uh, we owe Todd a debt for that passion and that kind of commitment. So I hope you will join me in welcoming this evening, Dr. Todd Barkman. Let me see if I can get this microphone working satisfactorily. <clears throat> if you don't mind, thank you. That's what I'm inclined to do. I've learned from the best here, Mr. Cato. Uh, I, I just have to make sure I don't knock things over as I'm too uh, excitedly talking about this uh, topic. Um, I also have to say it's uh, fitting that we're in this room. I haven't been in this room for 20 years. The last time I was here, strangely enough, it was for a public input session that the DNR was hosting on um, the future of the Gordon X State game area. It was packed house, it was a very interesting uh, set of perspectives. Um, one of the main perspectives was 
that a trapper wanted to have the, his trails mowed by the DNR so he could get to his traps more easily. And so uh, a lot of d diverse perspectives were presented at that meeting. But um, uh, it's also just wonderful that there, I see several people here who are going to feature prominently in this talk, including uh, Steve Cato and Nate DeVries and um, our Lou and, um, and Caitlin over here. And I I'll highlight their, their contributions shortly. Uh, it's also quite an honor to be here and just to see what a vibrant group you have. So congrats to all of you for, for keeping this going and growing. Um, very important to do that. Okay, so let me see if I'm going to try to deliver on two things. I'm going to talk about a lot of gloom and doom. And then I'm not going to have any answers for anything, any questions that I pose. Okay, so those are two promises I have for you. Um, but my main hope is that we generate some discussion and, and maybe together figure out uh, some answers to questions or, or, or what fruitful next steps uh, this project could take. Okay, so to begin, here's the first gloom and doom slide that our, our, our colleague Tyler Bassett provided. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so you can read the headlines, nearly 25, nearly a quarter of the species of, of native plants in our state are in some uh, uh, state of uh, vulnerability <clears throat> or, uh, and or are already gone. So here you can see a total of 448 um, Plant species are vulnerable in our state. That includes those 114 that are merely special concern at this point. So those, of course, don't have any legal protection. But there's uh, a number of threatened endangered and endangered species, as well as those, those extirpated ones. But the main thing I want to show, though, then on this slide is, is you'll see on the right our, our lovely mitten. And wherever you see a black dot, that's a hot spot for rare species. And I think you'll see in a slightly non-random way that Southwest Michigan's got a lot of dots. And Gordon X State Game Area right outside our door here is one of those hot spots. <clears throat> of course, so is our entire county. So here's a wonderful map the MNFI and, uh, and to, in collaboration with others and produced about the, the pre-settlement uh, pre vegetation of our county. And, and you can see the various colors, yellow being prairie, the distribution of, of, of uh, prairie in our county, um, and we've got beech maple forest and, of course, uh, abundant uh, oak savanna and oak hickory forest types. Um, but that was 200 years ago. <clears throat> today, uh, this is approximately what we've got to deal with. So um, according to MNFI data sheets, less than 0.1% of our prairie, savanna, and oak hickory forest um, types still exist, at least in non-disturbed uh, contexts. And so I, I tried to then overlay what would that mean for our county. So I went back to the previous map, counted up all the pixels that were prairie, and all of the prairie of our county would fit in this not-so-small red box. That's how much prairie used to be in our county. What does 0.1% of that look like? I'm not sure the people in the back can see anything but a red dot or square right there. That's all that would be left, best case scenario. Oak Hickory Forest, about the same, uh, at least in terms of uh, remnant or pre-settlement community types. <clears throat> of course, there's, at least for Oak Hickory, ab abundant secondary regrowth. So, of course, we still are pretty well forested in many areas, and you can see uh, Fort Custer there. Well, as a result of loss of community types, that, of course, means then a uh, loss of species and populations of species. And so uh, first and foremost, or one of the ones I like to show our students is, is this guy here on the left. Um, this is compass plant, of course, and it used to occur in our county and no longer does, at least uh, where it did um, uh, originally. And then, well, you can see blue-eyed Mary, and those guys luckily still do occur in our county. But if, if you peruse uh, Dwayne McKenna's treatment for um, the flora of Kalamazoo County, you can see that, by his estimates, at least uh, 40 species no longer occur here that used to. And we've got plenty of herbarium specimens to prove that they used to occur here. Um, and then quite a few are, are, are then 
if they are still extant, are probably in trouble. <clears throat> in, in, in other words, there's one or few populations left of them. Okay, so that's a little bit of gloom and doom. Now let me, let, now let me turn this into uh, ecology class for a second. So if you care about populations, one thing you'd like to know is, if you have a population today, will the population size increase over time or will it possibly decrease over time? There are many, many factors that can affect that. And so we're gonna talk about some of those today, not all of these, obviously. Um, but in this, what I find to be a rather seminal work by Doug Shemsky and colleagues, um, they set out the, uh, a framework to think about this, such that there's these dotted lines that, that, that explain genetic factors that can affect population growth over time. And then these solid lines, which are purely ecological factors that could affect population growth over time. And so, not to go, I, I don't want to enumerate all of those, um, those factors, but what I do want to focus on is what we would, might call the demography of populations. And I'll break that down in a much more simpler way on the next slide. I'm going to try to make this sound fancy, but it's all quite simple, okay? <clears throat> if we consider individuals and populations, what affects the number of individuals that we might see in the population later? Well, adults have to survive, number one. And so in this slide, you'll see that there's some rate at which adults survive or don't. <clears throat> That's one factor. Population size is also changed because adults do one thing. In addition to surviving, they reproduce at some rate over time. They make some number of offspring. Those seeds then either germinate or they don't and become seedlings. Seedlings then survive or not. And then some will transition to becoming young adults, I guess you might say. If these, if these were trees that we were talking about, um, they would become saplings. <clears throat> saplings then survive at some rate and then some saplings become adults and then they contribute to reproduction within the population. So by my estimate, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parameters to think about. Seven pretty, pretty simplistic uh, uh, parameters to consider and I'm gonna take you through an example um, uh, looking at all those here momentarily. Of course, we have to thank our mathematician friends uh, for this part. What you do with those numbers then is that, a little bit of matrix algebra, and, and you'll come up with an answer, okay? So we'll show, some, we'll, we'll show some squiggly lines here in a second. Okay, as an example, <clears throat> and this is the kind of study that really has captured my imagination and, and, and got me excited over the years. Um, we can, using those parameters, we can predict whether populations are likely to persist over time or go extinct over time. And these folks in this um, publication were really interested in an astragalus that occurs in a pretty heavily traveled uh, national park. And they found that trampling was really affecting this rare uh, astragalus species. And so their estimate of all those seven parameters suggested that in the next hundred years there will be no more astragalus uh, at that site. Then they introduced a bunch of interventions, mostly they, they closed off areas where the plants were getting trampled, and those seven parameters changed, mostly for the better, and it looks like the population size, as shown by this line, is at least likely to stay stable for the next hundred years. <clears throat> So I've wondered, could we do this here in Kalamazoo for some of our rare populations? So we're, we're, you'll see uh, the application of this that uh, um, myself and others have, have done in, uh, in collaboration to study Rattlesnake Master. So here's the distribution of, of Eryngium yuccafolium or Rattlesnake Master in the U.S. And you, you, you can see that it's probably globally secure at this point. Um, but you can also see that it did range into Michigan uh, and, and still is here in Michigan, thank goodness. 
In Michigan, it is restricted just to, to the southwest most counties. And at least historically speaking, these were the numbers of populations in each of those counties. So 31 in total. <clears throat> I guess that sounds like a lot. Of course, uh, thanks to Tyler for providing the most updated numbers here from Michigan Natural Features Inventory Database. These are hot off of his keyboard. Um, what we can see now is of those 31 that were tracked, historically speaking, it looks like we're down to 11. <clears throat> and um, of those 11, then you can see the approximate sizes of those populations. So one population with an estimate of 15 individuals in that population. Um, looks like Van Buren stacks up the best. The, most, the highest number of rattlesnake master individuals are found there. <clears throat> One caveat about these population sizes is that you know plants are annoying and oftentimes one plant will put, produce multiple stems and so it's really hard to know how many individuals are in a site but at any rate you can just take these stem numbers as you know, higher certainly can't be worse. <clears throat> okay well with, with, with such a dire situation for this species in our state uh, I can't help but get a little bit concerned. If there weren't any in Kalamazoo County, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know what I would do if I would drive to neighboring counties to work on this. But since we've got this guy in our backyard, I can't let people know, oh yeah, there used to be Rattlesnake Master here in Portage, but there isn't anymore because I didn't do anything. I don't want that to be the case, so here's, here's, what, here's the kind of things that we're doing uh, in these next slides I'll show you. Um, oh, well, and in fact, of course, it used to be... <clears throat> There used to be 13 populations in our wonderful county. We're down to one. Here's one of those. Here's a, a specimen from one of those that used to grow. Um, Richard Brewer, um, if, if he were here, he would um, might shed some tears because this was these individuals were collected from the corner of Stadium Drive and Howard, where there was a wet, wet prairie, historically speaking, and so. We've got proof that it used to occur there anyway. <clears throat> okay, so here's the story. Here, here's where, where things begin for us. A few years ago, um, I, there were specimens in our herbarium for where this occurred. I, you, know, you, you can't just walk out to the Gordon X State game area and find the three individuals left of a population. So I was fortunate enough to connect with Chad Hewson, who knew of uh, where these these plants occurred. So he took me out there and this is what we saw. I don't know if any of you cultivate rattlesnake master, but those are some pretty terrible looking rattlesnake master plants. Okay. <clears throat> um, but at any rate, we sought them to, to study these seven parameters and see what's, what's the problem with this population. Why isn't it increasing in size? <clears throat> so first thing we, we realized was um, they don't look great and other people have suggested that if they call it button a ringo, by the way, um, if it's in a shadier environment, it's going to look like that. Um, and we reasoned if we lose the adults, there will be no population. So we, we sought to try to understand what could be affecting the survival of those adults. <clears throat> well, when we went out to the site, this is what we saw. We, we were looking at the plants. We turned around and we saw a wall of glossy buckthorn. So that had to go. <clears throat> Fortunately, Lou Mitchell is super talented with a brush cutter. So he went in and started cleaning house. And eventually that's what it looked like. And the next year, by golly, look how perky those rattlesnake masters looked. <clears throat> okay, so we thought we were onto something there. So then we said, adult survival is great, but these guys have to reproduce. It's that red arrow producing seeds, what we call fecundity of individuals that we, we really need to study and understand. And so Lou and I would always go out in the afternoon and things looked great and sunny. And then we went out one morning and realized, wow, no wonder these guys aren't reproducing. They're only getting sun half the day. And so... Um, Don Poppy, who's one of my favorite people in the world, um, allowed us to go out and, and clean up a bit more. Fortunately, Lou's a certified arborist, 
<clears throat> there were trees harmed for this study, okay? So here's, here's Lou. I don't know if people back there can see this, but these, this was a monster black oak. <clears throat> and it did hurt both of us to have to cut that down, but, um, but it eventually did go down. And um, by golly, you won't, won't believe, but sure enough, these guys started blooming. So, so, uh, so light is therefore beneficial for adult survival and for reproduction of rattlesnake bastard. No big surprises. So although the individuals were flowering, that flowering doesn't mean that you're going to get seeds, of course. And one of our problems was there was one clump and only one clump blooming in the first year of, the, of, of, of our work. Now, if you've ever tried to cross or, or, or self-pollinate tobacco plants or potato plants, those guys don't breed with themselves. They're self-incompatible. Um, fortunately, uh, it's reported that Rattlesnake Master does have some degree of self-compatibility. So we had hope that even if these three stems were from the same individual, that we might get some offspring. Um, there is also reports, there are, excuse me, reports of, of seed predation um, by lepidopterans. And so we were worried about uh, even if seeds were produced, would they, you know, would they all be eaten? Well, luckily, there were seeds produced. So the red arrow is looking good for this population. So that... <clears throat> So now we have to seek to understand, well, why isn't it increasing in size if the, the adults are surviving and they're reproducing and they're making seeds? Okay, <clears throat> here in where uh, starts the story where we had to ask for permission to do everything else that I'm going to talk about because, of course, this is a state-threatened species. So fortunately, at that time, Lori Sargent and now Casey Wright's um, gave us permission to do this work, so we were allowed to then take some of those seeds, go to the greenhouse, and, and work with them. All right. <clears throat> so, the one thing we wanted to do was, was understand the biology and not mistake the biology because of our lack of expertise. And so, as when I was fortunate at WMU at the time to be able to call in the expertise of, of, of someone here in, in the audience... Um, Mr. Cato, who I think is wearing the same shirt uh, uh, as he is. <laughs> um, and so if we're, if we're going to collect seeds of some of the last remaining Kalamazoo individuals, the last thing I wanted to do was not treat them right. And so we, luckily we were able to call on Steve Cato, who in collaboration with Chris Jackson, our greenhouse manager, um, treated these things to the proper uh, stratification and uh, length of cold exposure and subsequent conditions such that, by golly, we got some seedlings. So whether they're selfed or, or whether those were three separate individuals blooming, I don't know, but they were able to make some babies. <clears throat> to our surprise, two babies showed up outdoors too. So I, I will say, for the permit, we were only allowed to take a, a small proportion of the seeds produced so that the rest would stay there and hopefully do exactly what they did. <clears throat> the one thing we did notice, though, was there was a lot more seedlings. There were a lot more seedlings produced in the greenhouse than were produced outdoors. So there, I, think we're, I think we're finding one of the weak links here is in this seed to seedling transition. The seeds uh, aren't happy about something out at that site. Of course, there's precedent in the literature for that as well. And so um, it has been suggested that a little bit of fire is what seedlings of Rattlesnake Master really like best. So um, after this, I'm going to be begging Don, Poppy, and Nate DeVries to burn a little bit out there in, in Gord Neck. <clears throat> so that hopefully we can increase the, the, the number of seeds becoming seedlings. Okay, with seedlings in hand, the next question is, will they survive outdoors? Or is this the reason we're not seeing more adults? Is because seeds do germinate into seedlings, but then seedlings never survive or never grow into adults. We didn't know, so we took those seedlings and then planted them, uh, planted them outside. 
for this work, uh, I was fortunate enough to collaborate with Lou again and, and Caitlin Renahan um, to, to put out the seedlings in, in a manner in which we could track them over time. And so um, this is then going to allow us to understand uh, the rate at which seedlings stay seedlings or survive in other words. And here's what we found. So uh, there were no seedlings in 2019, but in 2020, we planted about 14 seedlings. That's as many as we had from that first year. And um, you can see not all of them survived, but nine have survived for three years running now. Um, and so we're pretty hopeful. <clears throat> so apparently seedlings don't hate the site that much. The next stage to consider then is, is, will any of these seedlings become young adults or saplings, for lack of a better word, in this particular case? And then will those saplings survive? Well, you may have to have me back in a couple years. Um, these guys are pretty slow growers, but we have had two individuals become what we would call saplings. And we use an arbitrary definition here of, of they had to have more than 10 leaves and have a span of 10 inches or more to be called a sapling. <clears throat> so two individuals, two seedlings, two of those nine have become saplings. And our real problem though is no, no seedling that's become a sapling has then become a reproductive adult. We're still waiting, but maybe 2024 will be the year. <clears throat> okay, so now going back to this mathematical model, we've estimated the rate at which adults survive, the rate at which they reproduce and how much they reproduce, seedling germination, seed germination rates, um, seedling survival rates, seedling to sapling transitions, sapling survival rates, and this is still our big unknown. With all those numbers, do a little number crunching, and this is what I can show you. Our population today is three individuals, and in 50 years, it's still gonna be three individuals because apparently no one's ever going to become a new adult. Well, that's pretty dissatisfying, isn't it? So um, the good thing about numbers and, and computations is you can explore what might happen. And so if one allows for the sapling or young adult to reproductive adult transition to be 1%, that doesn't seem like that's asking too much. Um, we could see that in 50 years, the population might increase. So next year, we are going to be watching those saplings. And if you see someone out there with a fertilizer can, it might be me. Okay. Now, the thing about numbers, of course, is there's uh, always some uncertainty. And so, uh, so these simulations then were run assuming a wide array of possibilities in terms of sapling to adult transition rates. Um, and we, but even though we feel pretty good about the, our estimates for some of these transitions, we, we have no clue about that one. Well, under a wide range of possibilities, this is what you can see. Sadly, there's only two cases where things look quite good in 50 years. Um, in the rest of the cases, mm, modest growth at best. <clears throat> So, um, so sadly, uh, I think the future is still uncertain for, for Rattlesnake Master out at Gordon X State Game Area, but by golly, we still have these three, three adults to, to put our, our hope in. And we were especially excited two years ago because all three of them bloomed at the same time. So finally, there was a possibility for some degree of cross-pollination. These may be brothers and sisters, I don't know, um, but nonetheless, it's probably uh, better than um, having seedlings all produced from one mom. Okay. <clears throat> so our, our burning question here really is, what's limiting seed to seedling transitions in the field? Because we left hundreds of seeds out there last, uh, well, two years ago, maybe thousands, and there were no seedlings to show. I think um, part of it might be that it's, there's so much vegetation, it's hard to see them. So again, if, if someone could burn that site for us, we would at least be able to see things more clearly. 
So nobody in this room better call the, the fire department if they see smoke arising over Gordon X State game area, okay? <clears throat> All right, so the second case study I just want to talk a little bit about is that of Coriopsis palmata, and I won't take you through the, the gory details um, as I've illustrated for Rattlesnake Master, but um, I'll merely show you the few things that we've learned in this case. So here for Prairie Coriopsis, or Coriopsis palmata as it's known, um, here are the historical localities. Again, look at Kalamazoo County. Was the hot spot for Coriopsis palmata. Here, thank you to Tyler again, here are the latest data according to MNFI database. And this was uh, fairly systematically surveyed by Tyler um, and Brad Slaughter uh, um, a few years ago. And so now you can see one county where there is no more Coriopsis palmata and Kalamazoo County is not looking great. <clears throat> um, nonetheless, we've, we've got, uh, uh, we do have a population making, uh, uh, reproducing. So here, um, not unlike Rattlesnake Master, um, can you guys see the, the Coriopsis palmata population here? This is one of the historical Kalamazoo populations at its best. I guess there's one stem right there lanky, <clears throat> very shaded. Turns out if you've got friends that really like chainsaws and brush cutters, you can, you can clear the way. And so that, in, that individual the next year was reproductive. It's still not looking great, mind you, but uh, you give these guys a little bit of light and um, they do seem to respond. One of the challenges with this particular population is it's, it's not in a, a setting where our DNR friends will let us do whatever we want to do. Um, and so um, there, there are challenges in, in this way because if, if Nate DeVries would have had his way, there would be no more trees along 12th Street um, near center, okay? All right, so where there are blooms, of course, there could be seeds. And so Coriopsis palmata is reported to be self-incompatible. So when we had these few individuals blooming, we were quite pretty unsure whether there would be fruits uh, produced and, and if there were fruits, if, if the seeds would be viable. Nonetheless, when we sprinkled these, these in, in the seed germination trays, at night, Steve Cato comes in with a little bit of magic powder and he sprinkles it over the trays and up pop these seedlings. <clears throat> A few observations we made were curious, though. Some seedlings looked great and darted off immediately. Others, the first true leaves came out white, and that was the end of the plant. So some, uh, apparently some mutation uh, related perhaps to chlorophyll accumulation um, in, in certain seedlings. <clears throat> Does that suggest that there's parents in the population carrying deleterious alleles? It might. There were a few other strange uh, phenotypes that we saw. So here are a bunch of Coriopsis palmata seedlings doing what they do, going for the sun. And this little fella stayed uh, rather shrunken it, its whole life. So I'm not sure, again, in this case, if there's a, other deleterious alleles in these populations that are still being carried by um, the parents found there, the few parents that still exist there. Nonetheless, we've gotten pretty darn good germination um, of Coriopsis palmata, um, although it has varied considerably over the years. I will point out that at this particular site, um, pretty, um, what do I want to say? Uh, there was management in 2019. Not surprisingly then, I, I guess we, we, we saw an increase in, in, in the number of seeds that would then germinate from, from parents on those sites. <clears throat> and then no management's happened since 2019, so last year was pretty miserable. Um, we'll see what this year looks like. Um, but in a good year like 2020, we, these, guys, these guys want to grow. And really the good news here is um, even for this single seedling that we got our first year uh, out at this site. Um, seedling survival was high 
and it became reproductive two years later. So these guys are not wasting time. <clears throat> okay, well, so the conclu to conclude then, I just want to um, hope, hopefully, con I, excuse me, I hope I've convinced you that breaking down population demography into these various transition states could provide insight um, that would help us strategize how to, how to manage our remaining rare populations here in, in Kalamazoo County and, and beyond. And that hopefully you've been convinced that um, even with limited data, the modeling um, will allow us to predict what, what population futures are like. Those models get much, much better with more data. So we're continuing to survey those populations and, and track those, those transition rates. Um, aside from demography, there are other issues to consider, of course, and I know this group thinks a lot about genetics, and, and we could, could certainly have conversations about that. Um, and, and, and certainly, genetics do play a role in long-term population persistence. Um, but finally, the main conclusion I've come to after all these years is, is after watching my, my dear friend Tyler Bassett have to go to sites only to see species decline, see populations go extinct, um, is that uh, while we're good at documenting the loss of biodiversity, we're not so good at preserving what's left of our biodiversity. So um, it would be really great if there was a, a branch of our government, that our state government, that was concerned with um, not just tracking a population decline, but doing something about it. Finally, I'll just acknowledge the folks that have helped with all this work um, and helped prop me up over all the years. Tyler Bassett with Michigan Natural Features Inventory. We're so proud of, of him and all that he's doing and has done thus far. Um, Lou and Caitlin have been invaluable partners to me for throughout this project and, um, and, and as has, uh, has have other members of the WMU Bio Club. <clears throat> the Bio Club was instrumental in preserving the, the valley forest at WMU. Um, DNR has been amazing partners. Uh, Don Poppy and, and Nate DeVries never say no. If you've got a good idea, um, they will help facilitate. And so Allegan State Game Area, it's, I hope you all realize it's palpable the effect those folks are having uh, on that natural area <clears throat> and Allegan as well. Um, at WMU, uh, Chris Jackson's been a wonderful partner at the, at the greenhouse and has really helped carry the native plant propagation project on for years. And, and Steve Cato, who's no longer with WMU Landscape Services, um, was, uh, <clears throat> was a transformational force in my life. And so I really want to want to thank you, Steve. Uh, your, your, your partnership's been uh, very dear to me. DNR, of course, provided uh, permission for us to do our work. City of Portage, Jamie Harmon facilitated our work um, with one of the Coriopsis palmata sites. Chad's, I, th I think Chad for taking me to find those, those rare buggers. And then my wife has been tolerant and, uh, and, uh, and has accompanied me on, on much of this work as well. So with that, I thank all of you for your attention. I'd love to have a conversation. So if we have people with questions, I'll, we're going to ask you to speak into the microphone so that we can capture it for the recording also. You want to start, Marie? I have a population of rattlesnake master in my yard. If you would be interested, I would be delighted to have you come look at them. And they're holding their own. Um, second, I was on the City of Portage Environmental Board when they were doing burning. I can help. <laughs> Nate, did you hear that? Um, um, well, that's, that is super to hear, Ruth. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that's become abundantly clear to me over the years, and Tyler probably thinks about it daily, is we know a lot about populations in public land. We have no idea as, as, a, as a civilization what's hiding out in people's private property. And so... Um, I, any information about other additional populations, remnant populations in, in our county or elsewhere are always welcomed, I think. <clears throat> so yeah, thanks. 
Well, okay, so does that include planted ones? Isn't that a good question? And so um, probably many of you were thinking about that very question when I made the claim that, let me just go back here to Compass Plant. I said Compass Plant no longer exists in our county. And everybody probably shook their head and said, yeah, it's in my yard. What are you talking about? <clears throat> Of course, we're, I, in this case, I'm referring to remnant populations, populations that were here prior to us becoming a state in 1837. So I think those are the populations that Tyler's most interested in and, and myself as well. <clears throat> right, okay, so now comes another wonderful question. What about the seeds or the pollen from these plants growing in our gardens? Why not? Why not take, if I'm worried about this guy not having an appropriate mate, why don't I just grab some pollen from the plant in my garden? Or why don't I just grab some seeds from the plants in my garden and sprinkle them out there? If I, plant, if I throw 10,000 seeds out there, I would like to think there will be some seedlings. Um, I think this really um, boils down to a question of one's philosophy and what the goals of your project are. And in this particular case, I think th this project has the goal of trying to maintain the gene pool as diminished as it must be um, at this site. <clears throat> Once there's a couple hundred individuals there, it, uh, it would be fun to see what the introduction of some new genetic material would be. Or we could, we could collect pollen from these plants and cross with individuals from those few other remaining populations that, and look at offspring vigor in that case. And if they're more vigorous than the self seedlings, that would be interesting and important to know about. Was Let's see if I can start that quickly. You hold on to yours. Oh, all right. Hi, I've collected uh, seeds from around old cemeteries out in the country. It's a great place around the perimeter. Um, especially cemeteries that nobody attends to anymore. So I'd suggest start looking there. And if you need help doing that, I'd be glad to volunteer. Okay? Wow, that sounds great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, uh, um, it, it's, it's, I've always um, been enamored with the, the notion of our collective knowledges and, and what, we, what we could do if, if we all put our minds to the same task. I think we could achieve a lot more than obviously any one of us uh, individually. So I'm really excited to hear about uh, what, what you know. Could you please have the question re restated? Or it was more of a comment. Oh, that you can collect uh, endangered species from around um, abandoned um, cemeteries in the country. And there's a lot of them. I mean, if you go out towards Climax, and out in that way, there's a lot of them out there, and I don't think anybody's ever taken an inventory. I lived in Illinois for a while, and we started doing that. And we did high prairie, low prairie, and all sorts of stuff, and we replanted them, and they were pretty successful. Oh, great. <clears throat> and I'm sure all your friends mocked you for having this fascination with cemeteries. <laughs> Hi, Todd. Um, you said you had to get special permission to replant your seedlings back into the native population. So you're willing to bend the sort of native habitat rule for that. And who gives you the permission? And is that ordinarily done? Well, let me just clarify. Um, we were, as long as we don't touch these plants, we're not breaking any rules. Um, to then touch the plants or collect them or parts of them, we needed permission because they're protected by state law. Um, and so um, we had to write a, propo a proposal and, and um, stipulate how many seeds we were going to take and then what we were going to do with the seeds. And so we um, only the seeds from these plants were brought into the greenhouse. They were germinated, and those seedlings then were then put right back out to the same site. So it was, it was our way of trying to get at <clears throat> whether seeds would even germinate at all, because it's if you just throw a bunch of seeds outside, it's hard to know what's uh, 
what the germination rates are possible, what ger germination rates are possible. <clears throat> and so we have, from this work, we know seeds can germinate a lot more than we might think if we just go out to the site. But yeah, we haven't introduced any new, as far as I know, any new genetic material to that site, though. So introducing the seedlings back in is not regulated. Um, no, we had to have permission to do that. Oh, okay. So yeah. in fact, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I'm Lori Sargent probably would have given us permission to do whatever we wanted to, but um, yeah. we we told her we were going to take a small proportion of the seeds that were produced, germinate them, nurture the seedlings, and then put the seedlings back out at the site with the goal of increasing the population size. Um, so uh, there's a question about what about predation? Certainly I assume the deer were gonna munch these things to the ground. Um, for some reason, they uh, there was one seedling that looked like it had been munched on this past year. Was it a bunny or what? I don't know who it was. Um, uh, it may be that if you're rare enough, you just get overlooked. It may be that there's enough other stuff to eat out at Gordon X State Game Area that this isn't the most delicious um, treat. I don't know, but knock on wood, herbivory has been pretty minimal. Yeah, it's really sad to see their, the young shoots get, get, get eaten because then like, there's a whole... Then all of the leaves show show that. Can you repeat it so that we get it? Okay. So I, the question here was one of um, whether the lack of predation on the herbivores is possibly having. A, a negative effect on the plant populations. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, in, in uh, right, you're getting into ecology 101 here or 301, whatever. Um, so there are top. Okay, I don't. There's there are top-down controls on population growth, and so it may well be that um, if we were to control the predators of the herbivores, those herb the, the plant populations might do better than they currently are. We don't have any evidence at this site anyway that herbivory is the problem. <clears throat> so I work for the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy. I'm going to add to that. And at deer absolutely do like kill like a lot of the native plants. That's why like a lot of our preserves, we have like deer hunts to control the population, and so far it's worked pretty well. Yep, I mean, I see just about everyone in here nodding their heads about this one. Um, so so uh, certainly in general, herbivores have an effect on, pop, on plant population growth rate, absolutely. Um, we've been fortunate, and just don't tell the deer, okay, but we've been fortunate that they haven't, they haven't impacted this population yet. Looks like the microphone's going to make its way over to the right side of the room here. So it sounds like we would increase the odds of um, increasing the population of palmita and uh, uringium with better restoration projects or practices. I'm kind of shocked that Gordnack doesn't burn. It, they just don't do that, right? <laughs> it's kind of really surprising, right? There's definitely been fire at Gordneck in the past. Mm. Um, this particular site is would make some people pretty uncomfortable, yeah, because of its proximity to non -gord uh, non game area mm. properties. Um, yeah, Gordneck is such a fascinating, fascinating state game area. It's Inter, uh, interdigitated with the city of Portage, with people's uh, private residences, and um, uh, it's just a fascinating spot. And but it's it's one that Nate and Don are doing a great job of raising the the profile of. And then uh, the Palmeta um, population. I, I know I won't I won't 
disclose where the, the Western population is, but if we could do some, I, I know you mentioned uh, removing buckthorn, you know, on that hill, and I could get a crew out there next week, you know, we should, <laughs> if we could do, and if, you know. You, Let's talk. Yeah, right. Let's talk, yeah. Right. Um, it, um, it, it turns out not everybody's got the same priorities as we all do. Mm. Um, so um, when I when I meet with certain folks on campus um, who could do what you're describing, um, that doesn't rise to the top of their list right. of things to do. It turns out that people don't like dandelions in the lawn at WMU. <laughs> so that, they, that, there's a mm. lot more complaints about that than there are buckthorn on the hillside. So maybe if we could get all the donors to WMU to complain about the buckthorn, we wouldn't have right. any problems. Right. But right now it's dandelions, okay? Yeah. And then last thing. So I know a lot of people here fly their plants from Chad, and if his plants are coming to the seeds from that population, I mean, this is just me with high hopes thinking, we are spreading these uringiums and palmata. I know his are definitely coming from some of those in, in yards. And so with that, you know, with this group, this group in, in, in specifically has that in mind, you know, of what can we do? That's what I'm thinking, like, what can we do with this problem? And I don't know, you know, I don't know if Chad's, are they, are they from these sources? Yeah, you would know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a it's a great question, and I don't, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure everyone keeps good records of of where their seeds came from. Yeah. One question then becomes, though, if you've got germplasm from multiple different areas, then what do you actually have in your nursery five years or ten years later? I don't know. Do we even need to be concerned about it? I don't know. These are great questions. And, and again, they t t tend to be more philosophical than anything else. Um, but um, we're taking, this, as you can tell, a quite a conservative approach here, um, just so that we can understand the system. Once we understand the system, then maybe we can investigate some other sort of perturbations that might allow us to understand other things uh, about it. <clears throat> but yeah, please keep cultivating your local, your local species and your local genotypes of those species, please. Thank you. Yes, my question was related to Mike's last question. With animals, if you have such a small population, you get inbreeding. You want to bring in what Mike was talking about, you know, uh, other uh, uh, lines of the same species. So is it different with plants? I mean, these are such small numbers that we're talking about here. Yeah, so that's such an interesting question. The question's about, um, should we let these three possibly brothers and sisters be mating with each other? Um, and I mean, in this case, it's the same plant producing its own offspring. So there's, there's a couple answers I have for that. Um, um, one point is that populations that inbreed um, uh, do have a way of purging, what, okay, to use the, the parlance, purge their deleterious alleles or their genetic load, as it's called. And so, um, so in other words, if, 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 in, if, inbred, if brothers and sisters do mate, a lot of their offspring may end up dying because they've combined two deleterious alleles, but the ones that survive have the alleles that it takes to survive. And so if this population was inbreeding for the last 200 years, there might not be that much inbreeding depression or genetic load left. We don't know. But um, again, since we saw good germ seed germination, I feel like the genes aren't that bad and the seedlings are surviving. Um, will all the seedlings peter out and none of them achieve reproductive maturity? I don't know, um, but I I'm hopeful. But yeah, absolutely, we would, I think, again, if, and you'll see me being biased towards a conservative approach, I think in the future, we would like to get pollen um, from other sites and at least in a controlled manner, cross them to see if we can see improvements. And if we see huge improvements, it will be hard not to have promote some degree of outcrossing from these other populations. Um, presumably, 
300 years ago, there were more or less continuous populations of rattlesnake master between here and Van Buren County, and individuals were exchanging genes. And so it's only natural for us to, to perhaps intervene and mimic that, um, but maybe in a few years. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> Any last questions? One, maybe one more. Is there enough information for us to ask the state to pursue legislation to protect these populations? Maybe I live in a, in a box, but I don't know how the state can't want to do that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, let's just go back to the numbers here real quick. When you do the math here, I don't know how you can't be a little bit concerned. And so, yeah, if you can talk to somebody who who could introduce legislation and heaven forbid rate taxes more um, so that we could form an, a, a unit of our government that would be responsible for doing something about these population declines. I think that would be the greatest thing that's happened in my lifetime. Is there enough progress with the population decline for us to understand scientifically how to do it? I mean, what you're talking about is still a lot of trial and error. And so do we just need to develop more? Do we need state funding to have more documentation of these sort of things across the state or how can we do that what what people have spent a lot of time developing theory and studying um population size changes um in in more controlled settings and 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 maybe um in more amenable systems these are the worst systems to try to study this in uh and, and most of the models were uh, assume you're working with an annual plant a plant that uh most of the modeling and studies have been done on annuals. And so long live perennials throw monkey wrenches into the whole theory. Um, so do we know enough? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not a population ecologist by training, but um, I don't think there's anyone uh, that I'm aware of that could walk into some site um, and know exactly what needs to be done. I mean, aside from controlling invasives and then and, and for these light hogs, open up the open up the site or burn the site. But Tyler, do you? Yeah, we, we know these places need to be managed. That's not the, that's not the bottleneck of understanding. And we know, we can know more about the fate of these populations, um, that those data are really hard to keep up with because there's so many populations. Um, so that's, there's always more that can be done there. In terms of the protection, I mean, the reason why Todd needed a permit is because rattlesnake master is a state endangered species that has legal protection. Uh, the hard part is enforcing those laws. Um, and in this case, the law is being enforced because Todd went to the, the agency that enforces it and asked permission and got that permit. And because he got that permit. Now there's a paper trail of what's going on with that specific population. And that's sort of the purpose behind all that. But so there are bits and pieces of all that and all kind of all of what I think I heard you said or say, uh, but, but yeah, there's, I mean, the, there's, the laws are there. They can always be, um, uh, enforced and promoted more doggedly for sure. <clears throat> and, and I hope I didn't make anyone feel, or I hope I did not make it sound like there isn't great manage, manage, management being done. Quite the contrary. Again, what, what Nate DeVries does on a daily basis is fabulous, okay? And, and so, thank goodness, there's still a population of Cypripedium candidum in Kalamazoo County because a year prior, I didn't think there was. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming down to the Portage District Library tonight to participate in Kalamazoo Wildlands programs. Thank you, Todd Barkman, so much um, for being here with us tonight and enlightening us. Um, 
There is one more Kalamazoo Area Wild Ones event that's happening in December. That is Pints and Plants on December 14th at Brewery Outre. That's downtown. There's information on Facebook, and we'll make sure it gets on the website as well if you're interested in joining us. We've had between 30 and 45 people out chatting, talking about native plants. It has been fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, and then we will see you in January for the next Wild Ones program. Thank you so much.